So I want to start out just by looking at a few charts, uh, just to get you uh, into the topic, and uh, we'll see what's going on with debt and deficits uh, these days. Uh, the first chart uh, is uh, is a government debt. Okay, I mean that's the big issue uh, now. Anyhow, I mean we hear it uh, endlessly on the uh, national news uh, every evening. Uh, the numbers look awfully big on that uh, vertical axis, and I think what we'll do is put the uh, debt limit up here first. It goes like that, sitting pretty high, uh, and. Uh, <laughs> If we look at the way that the debt has played itself out, it goes something like this. Okay, let me try that just again to get it to work right. Ah. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, so you can see uh, we finally, it looks like we have finally, uh, at long last, uh, reached uh, the debt ceiling that's set at about $14.3 uh, trillion. Now, that chart uh, in, in this respect is just a little bit disingenuous because it, it looks like that debt ceiling has been set there uh, from way back when, uh, which isn't actually the case. Uh, more revealing is another graph, if we can get it to work. First time I've had a hardware problem in here. There's the other graph. And I don't know if you can see both lines or not, but the dark red line uh, is the debt ceiling, okay? Uh, and. The light green line is the debt, okay? And what we see is miraculously the debt ceiling keeps just ahead of the debt, but just barely, okay? It works that way. If you tally it up, uh, you see we first had our uh, debt ceiling in 1917. That's when the ceiling was first imposed. And it was imposed at a pretty low level There it is, 1917 debt limit was 11.5 billion, okay? Which hardly registers uh, on the axis. Uh, these aren't inflation adjusted, but that is so small compared to what it is now that even if you do adjust it, it still doesn't show up, okay? Uh, uh, 200 billion, which, well, it would show up. It's just a, a fifth of the way up between zero and one, okay? That's uh, doing it in... Uh, real terms in uh, making it equivalent to what, uh, uh, where we are today. Um, now, what strikes me as odd here about the debt ceiling, one thing that makes it odd is that this is the only country that has one. If you look at other countries around the world, they don't have any debt ceiling. Uh, they've got a Congress or something like it uh, that's supposed to behave in a fiscally responsible way. And here we've got a Congress who has the power over spending, the power of the purse resides with Congress, and they also have the power to set the, the debt limit. So it's the self-same organization that's putting a limit on itself and authorizing the spending. Now, in practice, what happens is that they authorize payment on some formula basis and turn it over to the Treasury, and the Treasury can issue bonds to uh, conform to legislation that's already been passed, and just to make sure they don't get too far out of hand and put a debt ceiling, and as you can see, change it uh, occasionally. Uh, so anyhow, despite that, we can say that uh, the debt ceiling uh, is is something akin to a New York or to a New Year's resolution. All right, but there is a difference. I have to admit, there is a difference, and that is that. Uh, over these 94 years that we've had the debt ceiling has been violated more than 100 times, okay? More than 100 times. Whereas with New, York, New Year's resolutions, they're only violated once a year, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and so we're better off with New Year's uh, resolutions. 
I might explain a little bit about what's going on right now uh, in Washington. This, this lecture wasn't particularly meant to be topical, but boy, is it. I mean, given the, uh, the turn of events, you might remember the date May 16 of this year, which was supposed to be initially the day that we would hit the debt ceiling of 14.3 uh, trillion. Remember that? And then when that date came and passed, then all of a sudden, well, it's really August 2nd. Uh, and it's in instructive to see how the government is getting itself from May 16th to August 2nd. Uh, where is it getting the money? I thought we were supposed to hit the ceiling at May 16th. Uh, according to Tim Geithner, the Treasury Secretary, um, he has had to resort to extraordinary measures. Let me put it simply at first, and then I'll explain the nuts and bolts of it. Uh, and that is that up to May 16th, the federal government was borrowing money and spending it. Okay? They were spending borrowed money. Uh, between May 16th and August 2nd, they're spending money to be borrowed later. Think about that. Could you spend any money to be borrowed later? <laughs> I don't think so. And it works like this, that uh, there are a number of investment funds uh, that are held by the government itself. Uh, let's say investment fund is part of the retirement package for uh, government workers. If you're a worker in the government, you have a retirement package, and <coughs> funds are available when you retire. In the meantime, they're held in an investment fund, and most of that fund is in the form of, can you guess, government securities, of treasury bills. Okay, so treasury bills are in the fund. Now, how, how does this help? Well, ordinarily, uh, retirement checks go out based on funds in that, uh, uh, treasury bills in that fund, and more treasury bills than that roll over each time, and those, those are just, well, they're rolled over. You just trade one treasury bill for another and keep the money invested in uh, treasuries. But now the extraordinary measures allow the government to do something different. They cash out. They cash out the treasuries that aren't needed this time around uh, to make payments to the retired workers. They cash them out, uh, and they can spend them. When they cash them out, then that, that means that the government debt has gone down by that amount. Well, how do they make good on that? Well, they put an IOU in the hopper. Uh, it could be a little post-it note or something like that, we owe this fund so many treasury bills, and we'll buy them, we'll buy them, but we have to wait until the debt limit is raised, <laughs> okay? So this is funds to be borrowed later. And if you do the arithmetic, you see the government uh, lately has been borrowing at the rate of about $4 billion a day. And if they go 78 days between May 16th and August 2nd, uh, they'll run up about $312 billion in funds to be borrowed later, okay? So one thing to watch for is that when they do raise that uh, debt limit, uh, we would expect to see, or we certainly should watch for, a spate of borrowing, all right? Far in excess of what the government normally borrows each day, because they've got to borrow the $4 billion just to keep the government running, plus they've got to work on uh, borrowing enough to make good on all of the uh, all of the treasury bills that they've cashed out from those uh, programs. Uh, so that's how it's working today. Uh, it's not particularly uh, encouraging. Uh, if we do hit the debt ceiling, uh, which I don't think we will, I, mean, I think the ceiling will be raised when push comes to shove. That's the way uh, Washington works. But I would like to mention that uh, how government responds in almost an opposite way of the way markets respond. That when markets have to cut costs, what do they cut? They cut the most marginal expenditures, the most marginally useful expenditures that they've been making, okay? Uh, 
and trim down their costs in that way. But uh, when we're playing political football with, uh, with the debt and deficits, then the threat is to cut not the least important, but the most important. Okay? If we run out of money, we'll cut. We won't send out Social Security debt. We won't pay the military. We won't pay this and we won't pay that. Okay? You love to hear them to say, look, you know, if we hit this debt ceiling and, uh, and don't get it raised, we're going to have to quit subsidizing ethanol. <laughs> hey, hey, that's win-win. <laughs> okay? We're going to have to quit subsidizing all those windmills up and down Indiana. Have you seen them? Uh, that are trying to figure out how to generate power with the wind blowing across Indiana. Well, good. We needed to cut that anyhow. We'll have to, we'll have to quit subsidizing uh, uh, battery-operated auto uh, automobiles like the Chevrolet Volt, which turns out to have been a disaster uh, technically in marketing and every other way. Well, good. Okay, we need to cut those things anyway. But what you see is they threaten to cut uh, at the other end of that uh, spectrum. Uh, okay, well, I'm sure I've got a few more charts uh, here to show you. Uh, surplus and deficit. Sometimes this number is, uh, is hard to find on the web. So we're just going to look at the deficit. I've labeled it loud and clear there. Uh, boop, there it goes. <laughs> there it goes. And the reason it's hard to find, I remember I spent the better part of an afternoon a few years ago, I think they, they've cleaned it up a little now, uh, looking on uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of uh, St. Louis, looking for the data, looking for a deficit. And I, can't, I couldn't find a deficit. I couldn't find a deficit. And I was poking on everything. It turns out that it was billed as government saving, okay? Government saving. And of course, when you pull it up, it's all negative, <laughs> which meant that it was really a deficit. They were, they were going in the hole. So that's the way it looks. That little blip that you see there um, before it gets to the serious part, that's uh, borrowing during World War II. Okay? Uh, now, it's true that this is a, in nominal terms. So if you adjust it to real terms, uh, the World War II borrowing uh, looks pretty serious. But after all, the, all of the inflation created between then and now is due in some part, in a fairly substantial part, uh, to deficit borrowing ex itself. So I don't hesitate to show that way in, uh, uh, in nominal terms. So that's what the deficit uh, looks like. Let's see what else we got here. Uh, international trade deficit. Uh, and it looks a little funny, too. There's Reagan years there, and then more recently, we've had some pretty serious international trade deficits, uh, which, of course, reflects all that deficit borrowing. Most of the borrowing in many of those years uh, was from foreign sources, China, Japan, mainly China, though. Uh, and what I want to call your attention to is how the rhetoric of deficit finance has changed, how the apologists for government deficits has changed. Back in the 1960s, this is barely on the map there, you can see deficits didn't amount to much. It's just sort of moving along almost zero. And uh, at that time, a bit of flip-flops in 1960, says don't don't worry about the deficit. We owe it to ourselves. In other words, the government was borrowing your savings. So we, the people, are lending money to we, the people, to take care of our governmental affairs. We're just borrowing it from ourselves. Well, I guess I should point out, I got this from Murray Rothbard. It's a, it, it proves too much. To say that, it proves too much, doesn't it? Because if we shouldn't worry about borrowing, because we owe it to ourselves, then we shouldn't worry about stealing either, because should we? We're just stealing from ourselves, okay? <laughs> shouldn't worry about any of those kinds of crimes. Uh, but what I want to point out today is the rhetoric has changed completely. In the 21st century, uh, we don't say we owe it to ourselves. In fact, mostly we don't. We owe it to the Chinese. So don't worry about the deficit we have access to world capital markets, <laughs> okay? In other words, we're borrowing it from somebody else. 
So now the summary line is, don't worry about the deficits because we're either borrowing it from ourselves or from somebody else, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Maybe we should worry. Well, okay. Government spending. It all starts down by the horizontal axis and goes skyward. Uh, probably the, the thing to note there, I mean, you knew what it looked like in general, but uh, it, it began to get out of hand uh, around 1970-71. What happened in 1971? Anybody know? Yeah, abandonment of... Uh, the gold standard, slamming the gold window. That was Richard Nixon, August 15, 1971, a day that will live in infamy, okay? <laughs> because that marks the uh, point where the, the government's hands just were untied at that point. It could uh, spin to its heart's delight and uh, borrow uh, accordingly. That's government spending. Uh, what do we got next? We got tax revenues. To see what they look like. And sure enough, taxes haven't increased as much as government spending has. Uh, and that first dip you can see is the tax uh, receipts went down as a result of the dot com bust. And they also went down because uh, of George Bush's tax cuts, uh, which was his stimulus program. And then it goes down again, of course, uh, in the most recent uh, contraction. Uh, and so uh, it's falling far short of government spending. Now, one thing I want to point out here that's, that's worth noting is that the uh, political alignments of uh, political parties with economic schools of thought has changed in a way that gives you plenty to worry about. There used to be a time, I can barely remember, okay, <laughs> when, when Republicans were against Keynesian policy. I'm thinking of Barry Goldwater in particular. Uh, and where Democrats were in favor of Keynesian policies. And of course, Keynesian policies are cut taxes or stimulate uh, or, or increase government spending or possibly both to get the government or get the market going again, okay? Uh, so one party, the Democrats favored that, and another party, the Republicans opposed that. Well, I wish it were the same today, but it's not. Now what we have is both parties are hardcore Keynesians. And the only difference is how they want to stimulate. So you see the Republicans as favoring a Keynesian tax cut stimulus and the Democrats favoring a uh, Keynesian spending stimulus, uh, leaving uh, nobody with power there to uh, argue the case for not pursuing Keynesian policy. We've got some pretty dramatic and uh, persuasive voices in that direction, but uh, certainly not the votes to, to do anything like that. Um, I'll, I'll mention a, a recent quasi-exception, and that's uh, John McCain. You'll see why I say quasi. And that is because uh, when John McCain ran for president, uh, he took undue criticism for his opposition to the tax cuts. And yet the opposition was a very principled opposition that understood that, yes, we need to cut taxes, but we need to cut government spending too. What we need to cut is government. Don't tax so much and don't spend so much, and you get yourself in trouble if you just opt for cutting taxes without cutting government spending. Well, that's the kind of argument that uh, even that Barry Goldwater uh, would have made, for that matter. Uh, now, I said, I use the term quasi, because if you'll remember, uh, John McCain actually suspended his campaign in order to go to Washington and vote for George Bush's <laughs> stimulus package. So uh, when push came to shove, uh, he was a Keynesian uh, for sure. Uh, McCain, uh, I started to say in his defense, it's not much of a defense, 
uh, would admit to uh, himself that economics was his weak suit. Uh, that's that's not what he specialized in, and of course it, it, it showed. Uh, but what I've observed as someone who teaches economics in various uh, places and to various groups, uh, what I've observed is that the, the, the two most difficult people to teach economics, two most difficult audiences, are the military and the clergy, okay? Because they both have a top-down view of how the world works, okay? It's all top-down. And uh, they don't necessarily see that uh, spontaneous order can, can work. Uh, okay, we've got tax revenues now. Uh, and here just a little interlude to, to set the record straight about uh, what my own preferences are, my own focus is. Uh, if we're going to talk about deficits, then willy-nilly we talk about government spending and taxes, because if they're the same, we don't have deficit. If they're apart, uh, we do. But I'll start out by acknowledging a, a book that uh, I, I love it in spirit and even in substance by Franz Oppenheimer. Uh, it's called The State. That's actually a recent printing uh, of the book. Uh, an older printing had the same type on it, but instead of just being all red in the background, uh, it just showed uh, a, a large area with dead bodies lying all over it. <laughs> so there's a certain conception of the state. Uh, but here's what uh, Oppenheimer Thomas said. He says, there's two methods of acquiring wealth, and one is uh, production and exchange, uh, and the other is uh, confiscation and threat of violence. Those, those are the two ways. And he identified these further, is that uh, the first is the economic means, and the second is the political means. And of course, he was in favor of the one and not the two. And he went on to identify the government as the organization of the political means. All right. So we could take a, a hardcore view uh, almost a Walter Block view, I guess I would say, and uh, saying, okay, enough already, we don't want any more taxes, we don't want any more government spending. And if I take that position, hey, my lecture ends right there, you know, <laughs> not much else for me to say. And so I think it's worthwhile to go on and realize that some fiscal policies are worse than others, okay, uh, even if you don't like any of them. Uh, so I'm going to have several questions. I may not get to all of them. We'll see. One is, uh, does the tax take measure the burden uh, of government? And two, are all taxes dollar for dollar equally burdensome? Uh, three, are taxes better or worse than budget deficits? That's the one I want to spend some time on because I think uh, we can get some ideas straight uh, there. Uh, What's the case for the flat tax or the so-called fair tax? We may get to that or may not. And uh, is, con is a consumption tax preferable to uh, an income tax? Here's where we have to tip our hat to uh, Milton Friedman, who uh, argued 25 or 30 years ago uh, that the focus on taxation as the cost of government is the wrong fo focus, okay? He says government spending rather than the tax take is a closer to the mark of gauging the burden of government. He's just thinking in real terms. He's realizing that uh, government spending is equal to taxes plus the difference between government spending and taxes. In other words, that's the deficit, part of which would be borrowed domestically, part abroad, part borrowed from the Federal mm -hmm. Reserve, who created it for the purpose and so. But ultimately, it's government spending that best measures the burden of taxation. Think of it in real terms. When the government spends, it's taking command of a certain amount of resources in the economy. That, that measures how much of the economy's resources the government takes to allocate uh, according to its own preferences, uh, leaving the economy with the rest of the resources. Uh, and so government spending 
uh, shows you the burden of taxes plus the burden of government of deficit spending in that sense. Uh, Dick Wagner, he's a public choice economist at uh, George Mason, uh, formerly at uh, BPI, formerly at Auburn, actually taught here for a couple of years. He would add the burden of regulation and uh, making the point this would be a friendly amendment to Friedman's claim uh, that it's government and not taxes that are measure the burden of, of uh, the government. It's government spending that measures the burden of government. And Wagner simply points out that <coughs> many objectives that the government can achieve by spending, it can achieve instead by regulation. All right? So in other words, it could spend money, it could spend funds, it could uh, command resources to try to clean up the pollution that it perceives in industry. Uh, and that would be government spending that would count as one of the burdens of government. But it could, alternatively, just impose regulations on industry and, and make industry uh, do what the government would have done by spending money and, and uh, commanding uh, resources. So uh, there's a burden of regulation there uh, as well. Uh, later on, I'll uh, make the case that it's one thing to argue that budgets, per, uh, budget deficits per se aren't bad except for uh, allowing still more spending and more influence of the government. But I will argue that if the budget deficits are chronically large, and I had this, I, I, I wrote papers on this 20 years ago, and of course now they're getting more and more chronically large, then that gives us an additional burden that uh, we wouldn't have uh, if, if budget deficits were in a much lower range. We'll see how that works. Are all taxes dollar for dollar equally burdensome? Well, no. Uh, it, it turns out that uh, some taxes strike at the heart of the market system. Those are the worst, okay? Those are the worst. And the best instance I could think of uh, for this is uh, Roosevelt, FDR's uh, undistributed profits tax. I know you've heard a lecture from uh, Bob Higgs. He probably mentioned the undistributed profits tax, but if whether he did or didn't, I'll remind you of it. But during the uh, Great Depression, of course, all sorts of regulations were imposed uh, on the economy. Uh, and one was a very high tax, up to 70%, on undistributed profits. Now, you know what we mean when we say undistributed. Distributed profits are, are the monies that are paid out as dividends to the stockholders, or that are even kept by the owners for their own consumption. Okay, that's distributed profits. The undistributed profits are profits that are plowed back into the enterprise so that it will grow. Okay, now imagine you uh, running a business, a small business, you've only run it for a few years, that's why it's still small. Uh, and when you make a profit, you can either pay it out in dividends, and all those dividends go to holders of the shares, or you can retain it, but if you retain it, you immediately lose 70% of it. All right. So this, this is a formula for stifling the growth uh, of business firms. That's their major source, especially with small business. That's their major source uh, of capital with which to become a larger, even viable uh, system. Uh, so now, I have to admit, though, that Roosevelt's undistributed profits tax was uh, about half, I say half successful, because there were really two purposes. Uh, one not so successful, and the other successful. And the first purpose was to raise revenue. Well, you really don't ma raise much revenue if you tax profits that dearly. It just means that firms aren't so interested in trying to make profits if they can't keep but 30%, okay? So that, that purpose wasn't successful. The other one, much more so. The second purpose was to strike at the heart of the market system, you see? <laughs> that worked out. Roosevelt, 
I'm not sure more or less than Obama. I suspect maybe even a little more. Roosevelt had a seething hatred for the market. He, he was sure it was the market itself that caused the economy to be in the awful shape it was in. And, and some of the blame was coming back to him. And so he, he really despised business people uh, and had this seething hatred. So he didn't have any qualms about imposing uh, a, a tax as burdensome uh, as that, okay? Now, it turns out the narrower the tax base, the greater, or I say at least, the more concentrated the distortion of economic activity and inequity uh, of the tax burden, the narrower the base. And a good example of this uh, is George, the first George Bush, 41, uh, his yacht tax. And I love this example. It, it makes a great classroom exercise uh, it made it onto my exam the very year the yacht tax was uh, implemented. It was implemented uh, in 1990 and finally uh, eliminated uh, three years later, 1993. Uh, let me explain to you what the yacht tax was about. It, it had some resemblance to what's going on now, and that is tax the rich. But see, here we got a Republican. We got we got Bush. So yeah, tax the rich, you know. It had, it had great public appeal, okay? Because you're not rich, so let's tax the rich. And then uh, we won't have to pay any taxes ourselves, all right? Uh, so tax the rich. Who are the rich? Well, they're the people buying yachts. They're the people who are buying luxury cars. If you remember the particular tax, it applied to automobiles, luxury automobiles, in excess of $30,000, okay? That was a little low for a luxury automobile, but uh, for 1990, it wasn't. That was, you, know, you paid $30,000 for a car in 1990, you're doing pretty good. And of course, yachts, I mean, who knows how much those things cost, but uh, we'll tax them, all right? Now, it's a lesson here from, uh, I'd like to say the Austrians, and certainly they are in it here, but Alfred Marshall gets the uh, kudos we're talking about the elasticity of demand. Uh, he's a you know, British uh, neoclassical economist, Mr. Neoclassical. Uh, and uh, it turns out that the demand for yachts is elastic. In other words, the uh, demand curve is, doesn't, steep, doesn't slope too steeply, is the way it's depicted here. Uh, it's elastic. And Marshall identified three characteristics of goods whose demand were elastic. And, and one is that if there are plenty of substitutes, then the demand for the product will be relatively elastic. You'll just buy the substitute. Okay? So if you put a big tax uh, on uh, okra, all right, just buy Brussels sprouts. Okay? Those taste about the same to me. <laughs> So you don't, you just quit buying oak, okay, buy Brussels sprouts. Uh, other things, if you tax cigarettes, you know, what do you do then? You know, okay, uh, I'll just buy okra. No. <laughs> <laughs> so if people, smokers themselves, they can't think of a good substitute for cigarettes, well, they buy the cigarette even though they have to pay more for it, and it's an inelastic uh, demand, okay? So, uh, and you might not really say, so, gee, what are the substitutes for a yacht? And it turns out you have to think more broadly. Uh, you think, how do the wealthy spend their entertainment dollar, okay? It turns out there's lots of ways of spending your entertainment dollar, okay? I'm, so I'm told, I mean, I'm not going <laughs> do that. But uh, lots of ways of spending. You can, have, you can vacation on the Mediterranean, you know, or you know, buy a couple extra homes uh, here and there, or whatever you want to do. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there's substitute ways of spending your dollar. So the big yacht tax, well, okay, so much for, so much for the yacht, right? Now, a second criteria, which again may not seem like it's applicable, but it is, that a, a, a curve will tend to be elastic 
uh, to the extent it's a, it takes a big part of your income, it takes a big chunk of your income. The price of that thing goes up and up and you have to back off, right? Now, a lot of people's view, especially people in favor of the tax, assume that for wealthy people, nothing to buy a yacht. You know, you buy one this morning and maybe another one this afternoon. <laughs> what the heck? But that's, that's not right. If you look at the market for yachts, most of the people who buy yachts are paying a pretty good hunk of their income for the yacht. All right? Now, okay, there are some people there on up the scale that can buy yachts all day, but we won't worry about them. The, the market itself for yachts uh, passes that Marshallian test. Uh, and the, then the third criteria is, over time, the demand curve will get more and more elastic. In other words, as time goes by, as, say, from 1990 to 1993, <laughs> people find different ways of spending their money uh, to buy yachts. So it's, it's uh, elastic. So look at what that means. If you, if you throw a yacht tax on there, which is just to say the, think of the saving of the supply curve as a cost curve, that's how much you have to pay for the yacht, the vertical distance, if you have a pay a tax too, well you just, uh, the cost plus tax included is the S plus T part. Uh, now if people bought the same number of yachts as they did before, then, uh, wow, you know, the, the price is just way out of line. You have a huge surplus of yachts. You have people uh, willing to supply that many yachts, but given the demand curve, not very many yachts would be bought. And of course, that bids down the price of yachts, uh, like so, and means you can stare at that diagram and see it, that the extra tax that the yacht buyer pays is pretty small compared to the taxes levied on that yacht. And yet, out of that tax-included price, the yacht seller has to send to the government the whole yacht tax, okay? And so... The rest of the tax, it turns out, uh, is not paid by the seller. It's paid by the, the people who are selling yachts. Uh, the people who are paying workers to make yachts and then selling them. All right. So it became apparent after just a few months, really, uh, and certainly more and more apparent as time went on, that the burden of the yacht tax was suffered by the yacht yard workers, right? I don't know how much you know about yacht yard workers, but they're not in the upper echelons in the income bracket, okay? They're way down low. Uh, and so they were suffering mightily. So the, the luxury tax uh, hit the lower income people much, much harder than the uh, upper income people uh, for that reason. And I'm, I'm happy to say uh, that uh, this diagram went on to one of my principal's level exams pretty early in 1990 to get students to analyze the yacht tax. Uh, through just watching the market, uh, the people in Washington figured it out after about three years. <laughs> okay? And they realized they had to repeal that particular tax. Uh, are taxes better or worse than budget deficits? And this first question uh, I had on, a, on an old, old lecture I gave some time ago that uh, bears little resemblance to the current lecture. But I saved that one slide just because that, uh, that question just struck me as funny. <laughs> you know, are, are current and projected buff, uh, deficits large? Well, we could take a vote in here and see. They're pretty huge, okay? Uh, and what we have seen in the past, not so much recently, just because deficits are so, so large, but what we've seen in the past is that uh, politicians try to explain away or try to excuse themselves for running fairly large deficits. Uh, and so they play a compared to what game? Uh, for instance, uh, are they large uh, compared to GDP? That's gross domestic products, total output of the economy, all right? They can't even say that 
uh, more anymore, at least not with respect to the total debt, which is about to hit GDP. The deficits, of course, are still fairly small compared to GDP. The annual increase in the debt is small to, compared to GDP. But as uh, Edward Dirksen, an old-time congressman from uh, Illinois, senator from Illinois, said, he said the major purpose of the GDP figure is to make anything else seem small by comparison. Okay? That almost anything is small compared to everything. Uh, and so that, that comparison is not necessarily a, a relevant one. Uh, compared to private borrowing. Look, the government's not borrowing so much money compared to how much the private sector is borrowing. Okay? And of course, those two kinds of borrowing are very different economically, but uh, equally important is that you can hardly excuse a whole bunch of borrowing by pointing out a whole bunch more borrowing. Okay? These, are all, these are people competing for the same money to borrow, so I'd worry more rather than less if other people were borrowing a whole lot too. Uh, the same kind of a comparison. Uh, U.S. Isn't, a, uh, isn't so bad compared to the borrowing done by other Western countries. Okay, Italy's ahead of us, you know, and so on. We're not the first of, of the line in borrowing Greece and so on. Uh, but again, this doesn't make us feel better this is even worse. You know, not, you know, we're doing all the borrowing, and the U.S. government's doing all this borrowing, and a whole bunch of other countries are borrowing a bunch too, uh, some more than us. Well, all the more reason to worry. In fact, the, the uh, comparison you want to make is compared to saving. In other words, how, how much is there out there to borrow? Uh, and of course, at the same time, borrowing has gone up in this country, saving has gone down which is, of course, why we had to have access to world credit markets to get any borrowing done. And that's the ultimate comeback here. Oh, well, we, compared to world credit markets, we have access to world credit markets and uh, there's plenty to borrow there. And I'll, I'll say two things about that. Uh, this used to be a supply side, favorite supply side argument that uh, the borrowing done by the U.S., is just a drop in the bucket compared to world saving. So don't worry about it, okay? So the deficit doesn't matter, doesn't do any harm, because it's just a drop in the bucket, okay? Well, wait a minute. We're borrowing about 40% of what we spend, which means 60% is taxes. And that certainly has some detrimental effects. So if we didn't collect any taxes, we could borrow everything in world credit markets. That's just two drops and a half in the bucket. Who would worry about that? Okay, <laughs> There's something funny about that argument. And it turns out, I think, that uh, if, in fact, uh, we borrowed some years and, and ran surpluses others and borrowed other years and ran surpluses, then uh, as far as the this magnitude of comparison, how much we're borrowing and how much is there to borrowing, to borrow, yeah, it wouldn't make that much difference. But you've seen these graphs, they're all one way and it's all up, all right? So when you're borrowing year after year after year after year, then the cumulative effect of that can be catastrophic and cause a crisis, currency crisis, a uh, breakdown of the uh, U.S. dollar and so on, and it'd be calamitous. So. Uh, again, not a good uh, comparison. <laughs> I just put up a, a sample here because I want to show you now you know, show you how chronically large budget deficits can have a big negative impact on on the economy. These numbers aren't too far from uh, the correct ones. That is government spending about three point eight trillion, tax collection about 2.5, leaving a 1.4 trillion to borrow annually. Probably more next year, but uh, that's uh, a, a yearly borrowing. Uh, and uh, it, it's, there's a, bigger, there's a bigger difference than you can see just by looking at the numbers. And it goes like this. Uh, taxing 
is done in accordance with uh, pre-known, maybe not too far in advance, tax code. And let's recognize up front that tax codes are very difficult to understand, they're way too complicated, uh, they got some perversities in them, in fact they're mostly perversities, but at least we know or can know or can hire a, an accountant to know <laughs> what the rules of the game are, okay? How, how our taxes are going to be collected. So there is a tax code. And businesses certainly are attentive to that. Uh, and they plan their affairs uh, in order to minimize the negative impact on their firm of the taxes that they're going to have to pay. So in other words, they know up front what's coming down the pike. Uh, subject to qualifications about the uh, ambiguities in the code and the undue complications and all that. It is a tax code and it's better. It's better than not having a tax code. All right? But look at deficits. I'll put this term on the board and ask how many have seen it. Has anyone seen the most recent deficit code? There isn't a deficit code. In other words, the government doesn't specify just where, just when, and just how it's going to get the funds to spend that over and above what it collects in taxes, all right? Uh, and that creates uh, an amount of uncertainty in the marketplace. Uncertainty that's not particularly bothersome if the deficit is pretty low, okay? Uh, if we were bor borrowing uh, 1.4 billion instead of 1.4 trillion, then not having a deficit code wouldn't be a big deal. But if we're borrowing 1.4 trillion, it is. Uh, and business firms don't know just how that borrowing is going to take place, what aspects of the market it's going to affect, and how it will affect their business. It's called regime uncertainty. And they, they just soon stand back and wait till they see something more specific before they put their money at risk. All right? Now, I can show you several possibilities. I'll show you how this works. You've got uh, some choices to make. You can borrow domestically. Can't do that too much anymore because there's not that much saving or wasn't until just very recently. Borrow from the Fed or borrow abroad. All right? And these have different consequences. And, and, and business people don't know in advance which way the government's going to go. And it tends not to even at the margin where it does all three and adjust at the margin. It tends to, tends to binge in one area until that causes trouble and then binge in another area until that causes trouble and then binge in a third area. So, so we can look at the consequences. If they borrow domestically, then that causes crowding out. There's going to be high interest rates. Uh, as the government borrows money from you, interest rates are high and business is crowded out. It can't pay that high an interest for funds to invest. It doesn't think it can make profits uh, given those interest rates. Or it can borrow from the Fed. That's going on now to some large extent. Uh, but, of course, that's going to cause inflation. And then people have to figure out, well, when's this inflation actually coming? How bad is it? How do I hedge against it? Or it can borrow abroad. And that causes weak export markets. So, so if you're in a business that produces for export, boy, you better watch that borrowing abroad, what it means. You see, if the government run, wasn't running these trade deficits, that means that freighters would come from other countries with cargo in their cargo bays, unload, and buy goods in the U.S. to take them back to their home country. Okay. And so if you're one of the producers of those kind of goods that they tend to buy, you're in good shape. But if the government, if, if the government is selling its debt abroad, then that means that when the freighters get here and unload, they don't put anything in their cargo bay. They just put treasury bills in their glove compartment <laughs> and go back home. <laughs> and so if you happen to be in a business where you were producing for export, you're in bad shape, and if you're worried about that, given how high the deficit is, then maybe you just don't invest, okay?
And we can even put names on this that, uh, at least in the early years, it's kind of b between then and now, between Reagan and now, they've tried to use anything and everything and, and uh, it, places to borrow. But Nixon gave us crowding out with high interest rates. Carter gave us inflation by borrowing from the Fed. Reagan gave us weak export markets by borrowing abroad. And the president since then uh, have done a little of each, mostly uh, borrowing from the Fed and borrowing abroad, because you, you people aren't saving much, okay, from which to borrow. Now, there's been some serious study about this, okay? Uh, and there was a, just a spate of journal articles that dealt with the issue of do deficits actually cause high interest rates, okay? And let's see. Another spate of articles, do deficits cause inflation? And a third spate of arguments, articles, do deficits cause trade imbalances? Okay. Now these are high power, top notch economists slash econometricians that want good answers to these questions. Okay. Now an Austrian answer might be something like this. Do deficits cause high interest rates? Well, they sure did during the Nixon administration. That's what he was doing, borrowing domestically. Do deficits cause inflation? Well, they sure did during the Carter administration. He borrowed from the Fed. How about the weak equity? Well, they sure did. In the Reagan administration, he borrowed from abroad. Okay? But that's too episodal for econometricians. So they use the data they use is all the data from 1947 to present. What's special about 47? That's when it became available. That's when the data was available. So we'll use all the available data in 1947 to present. And, and using all that data, that whole time series, can we say with some statistical accuracy that deficits cause high interest rates? What is the evidence? And let me report I'll give you one answer, and then I'll, I'll, I'll pump you for the other two answers. Their answer is weak and mixed, weak and mixed. We can't say for that whole period that deficits caused high interest rates, okay? Well, okay, there's a whole other thing. Do deficits cause inflation? They used all the data from 47 to present. What do you think their findings were? We can, we, this, this group catches on fact. We can, we can make. Do deficits cause trade imbalances? 1947 to present. We can mix. And so finally, finally someone did a survey article. Let's take all these articles and see what the collective conclusion is. Okay? Do deficits cause any problems at all? <laughs> Don't worry, be happy. <laughs> and of course, <laughs> the problems that get caused are precisely uh, come from the circumstances that you don't know what the particular problem is. It's sort of a two-tier problem. You're going to have a problem to deal with in planning your business affairs, A, and B, you don't even know what that problem is. So that means that you're likely to sit on the sidelines and write for, wait for better, better times before you invest your money. Okay, well, let me close there. Thank you.